When I was as old as many of you, I wanted to be an astronomer. I was fascinated by the night sky. Everything from planets to distant stars to nearby galaxies caught my attention. And with a little help from my parents, I saved up some money and bought a telescope. I wanted to know how the telescope worked and, and study astronomy and really understand how the science of astronomy was done. And that modern telescope that I purchased 20 years ago now, the, the design has been around for about 400 years. And during that time, astronomy, the science of astronomy, has done more or less the same way. Now it's changed a bit in the last few decades, and we'll talk about why that is. But typically, astronomers from colleges and universities all across the country and the world would travel to places like Kitt Peak National Observatory, just outside Tucson, Arizona, pictured behind me. And there's many wonderful telescopes of different sizes that dot the summit of this mountain. And astronomers would you know, get in their planes and, and travel off and, and have uh, dozens of targets that they've carefully selected. They'd obtain that data and travel home, making sure to keep that precious, precious data safe. And what's changed in the last two decades, basically since I started studying astronomy, is that there's been a new form of observing that has really taken hold across the community. And it's one that has really revolutionized how the science of astronomy is done. And it doesn't require going to a mountain. In fact, all you need is an internet connection and a laptop, and you can get your hands on some of the best and most exquisite data ever obtained. Now, this data has been obtained by digital sky surveys. These are the surveys that are fueling this revolution in observing, and there are two particularly important surveys that will continue to fuel this revolution over the next two decades. Now, in the 1990s, two important surveys led the way. The first was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which was based out of New Mexico, and the Two Micron All Sky Survey, uh, which had telescopes in Arizona and Chile. Now, these surveys were run in a, in a scanning fashion. Every, each and every night, they would go out and, and take as many images as possible, not sp specifically focused on a given target. And they would obtain digital pictures of, of the night sky, and usually over many different filters. So they were using different colors to, uh, to examine the night sky. Now, after um, running for many, many years, these two surveys delivered a precise, deep, and wide field view of our universe. Now, my own particular uh, research interest is of the Milky Way. I'm interested in our home galaxy and how it's structured and how it's changed over time. And because these particular surveys have such a wide field of view, they are ideal for studying our Milky Way. Now, if you were to drive far away from here, far away from any city lights, and look up tonight, you would see the Milky Way stretched overhead. You would see thousands and thousands of stars crisscrossed by dust lanes. And it's in that, that plane of the Milky Way where we see many of the stars of our galaxy. And if we could peer deep into those dust lanes, we actually would see star-forming regions. It's where new stars are being born. Now, the, the, what, the reason for studying the structure of our galaxy is because we want to understand how much mass is out there, how many stars are there, what's between the stars. And by studying the structure of the, the galaxy, it can tell us something about that. It can also tell us something about how much dark matter is out there. It's a, a, a substance that only interacts through gravity that we don't actually know quite what it is just yet. Now, while in graduate school, I compiled a list from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey of 30 million stars. And I measured their positions, their distances, and their masses. And by analyzing this data, I was able to produce the map that you see on the screen behind me. That map is, was, at the time, one of the most precise maps of our galaxy ever constructed. Um, it, it had unprecedented precision in terms of understanding just how many stars are out there and where we can find them. Now, this particular map is, is one that really relied on 
the strengths of digital sky surveys. One of the beautiful aspects of these surveys is that within the same images, we get many different stars and galaxies of different properties. Now, to create this map, I used stars that are a little smaller than the sun. They're a little dimmer, they're a little cooler, they're a little redder, but there are many of them out there. And if we map out where these millions and millions of low mass stars can be found, we can construct this map of the Milky Way. And what it's telling us is that if we go above or below the plane of the galaxy, pictured behind the, uh, the map there, that we find fewer and fewer stars. And that if we were to roam away from the galactic center, we would also see a gradual decline as we made that trek. Now, these stars can be seen for a few thousand light years. And I should say that it is the, the power of digital surveys that really allowed this to happen, right? It still took me a few years to make those maps, but if I were to try to make the same map using traditional observing modes, it would take many, many lifetimes. Now, within the same set of data, we can see stars that are intrinsically much, much, much brighter than these dim, low-mass stars. And that is interesting because they're millions of times brighter than the sun and can be seen at many, at, at much, much larger distances. They probe something that we call the galactic halo, this kind of spherical veil of stars um, that has little bits and pieces of, of what's left over after the start of our galaxy. And some of the, the most fascinating structure that's been found during the last uh, two decades is highlighted behind me here. In blue, there's a stream of, of stars. And this is the, the remnants of a former galaxy that was actually pulled apart by the Milky Way's extreme gravitational pull. And we see these stars wrapped around our Milky Way in, in almost all different directions on the sky. And the red stars are, are intrinsically very, very bright. These are millions of times brighter than the sun, and we can see them up to almost one million light years away. And we've found these things. They're just barely holding on to our galaxy, but they are, in par they are part of our Milky Way. Now, digital surveys have told us a lot about our galaxy over the last two decades, but that's not the end of the story. In 2013, ESA, the European Space Agency, launched Gaia. And Gaia is the first of two important surveys that are going to change how the future of astronomy is laid out. Gaia is designed to study our Milky Way. It has two telescopes. It's about 15 feet across. And it's tumbling in space, looking in two different directions at the same time. It's measuring properties of stars, how bright they are, how, what color light they're producing. But most importantly, Gaia is designed to measure distances. Stars actually produce tiny little shifts in their position over time. And those tiny little shifts, which are, are very small, they're equal to if you put a quarter on the moon, that's the kind of shift that you're looking for. Those little shifts allow us, with a little bit of geometry, to measure the distances to stars without any assumptions. You're only using math. You're only using a sign, which is a beautiful thing. And so Gaia has been mapping the night sky um, for the last five years. Now, in 2016, they produced their first public data release. This data release was over the entire sky and contained distances to about 2 million stars. Now, it's easy to see the plane of the Milky Way stretched across this all-sky view. You can see the dust lanes that are piercing through that plane. And below the plane of the Milky Way are two neighboring galaxies, the large and small Magellanic Clouds, which unfortunately for us here in this room are only really seen from the southern hemisphere. But what you can also notice with this image is that there are some artifacts in play, that there's um, leftovers from the scanning motions of the satellite that aren't quite filled in. And this was the first data release. It was clear that we needed more data, and the, the satellite has been obtaining that data over the last few years. And just in April of this year, Gaia produced their second data release. And this, without any exaggeration, it is going to be impacting my career and the careers of thousands of astronomers for decades to come. There is not a map or an atlas of our galaxy that is going to 
surpass this anytime soon. There are over 1.3 billion stars that are um, making up this image behind me. This map of the Milky Way is the most precise map that we've ever had. And you can see those dust lanes passing through and the, the beautiful structure of our Milky Way galaxy. In addition to measuring distances, Gaia is also measuring colors of stars. And so we can overlay that color information because the colors of stars tell us a little bit about their properties. It tells us how massive they are, how old they are. And so red and yellow stars that we see in the center of the, the Milky Way here indicate an older stellar population. These are stars that are billions and billions of years old. The bluish haze that you see in the, the plane of the, the Milky Way there is from young stars. Stars that only are going to last a few million years before they run out of fuel. Now, this particular data release is entirely public. Everyone in this room and everyone that watches this video can go to Guy's website and download all of this data today. Anyone in the world can access this data. And while Gaia will revolutionize our understanding of the Milky Way, it is not the only major survey that's going to change the way astronomy is done. The other beautiful aspect of the Gaia data is that not only does it tell us about the distances and properties of billions and billions of stars, it also tells us a little bit about our own star, the sun. Right? So I call this the, the Star Trek graph, you're looking at the average motions of stars across the entire sky. And our sun is headed off in uh, a direction to the left there. And so as we head off in that direction, just like you would in Star Trek, you know, our own little spaceship, we see stars passing by us. And if we look in the direction that we're leaving, we see stars kind of heading in that direction. Right? So this is telling us something about the galaxy. It's also telling us something about our own star. Now, while Gaia is going to change the game in terms of uh, Milky Way studies, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST, will also have a huge impact on the future of astronomy. This is an international project led by hundreds of astronomers and computer scientists and engineers all over the world. It's currently being constructed in Sierra Pachon, Chile, and when it's complete, it'll have an eight meter mirror in diameter, which is about the size of this stage. It is going to use this wide field of view to peer into the night sky each and every night, snapping an image about twice a minute. It's going to use six different filters to get a color image of that night sky. And the camera that's being constructed is, one of, is the largest ever built. This camera is, is going to hang above the primary mirror and record all the light that falls onto that mirror. Now, the, the wide field of view that's being produced by the telescope is being imaged by the largest digital camera ever constructed. This camera, shown here at full size, all those pixels being held by, by uh, our scientists there, will peer into the night sky with an area of about three and a half degrees. Um, to put that in terms that you probably are a little more familiar with, that's about seven times the width of the full moon. Every time an LSST image is taken, right, twice a minute, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of stars and galaxies within that particular image. In order to view one single image at its native resolution, you would need something like 360 4K TV sets. Right, this is going to be some of the most beautiful images ever obtained by astronomers. Now it's going to image the entire night sky. It'll take about three nights to, to basically reproduce one of those surveys from the 90s. And it's going to do that process for 10 years. So we're going to have the first high definition movie of the universe ever. That camera is, as you can imagine, not going to fit in your pocket, even though it's the same technology. A camera is going to be about the size of a small car. It's going to weigh about two tons. And will continue to produce those large images twice a minute, essentially every night for 10 years. Now, what are we going to do with this imagery, and, and why do we need your help? Well, one of the things that we've learned from digital surveys in the past is that citizen science has played an extremely important role 
and understanding the data. Right? We're going to have petabytes, thousands and thousands of terabytes worth of imaging data that will be served up publicly. We're going to allow citizen scientists all over the world, classrooms all over the world, to study these images, to, to explore the mysteries of the universe along with us. And for the first time in essentially in astronomical history, a major observatory is going to be producing publicly available data nightly. You can get alerts on your phones if your favorite star decides to, to blink a little bit. And so that is going to, to really kind of change how the public and astronomers interact with this data. Again, all you'll need is an internet connection, and you can have your hands on some of the most exquisite data ever obtained. Construction is currently underway, and when it's completed in a few years, it should look something like this. We're on schedule, and from a sneak peek earlier this year, things are progressing nicely. The, the mirror is, is um, nearly complete, and we're seeing integration of all the parts uh, starting to happen. And so when we're done, what will we have? Well, we'll have the, the best image of the night sky ever obtained. Right? We're, we're going to see about uh, a little over half of the sky, because you can't see through the Earth, unfortunately. Um, but there's about 60 petabytes worth of data that are going to go into the imaging catalogs at the end of this survey. It's going to require millions and millions of TVs, of 4K TVs, to, to view all those pixels. Perhaps more importantly, this is going to be a movie of the universe. Right? We're going to be snapping pictures of the sky every three nights for 10 years. For the first time, we're really going to unlock the window of time on the universe. And when we do that and produce this movie of the universe, it's going to be a must-see. I don't know if we're going to win Oscars, but it's, you're going to want to see it. We'll have asteroids crisscrossing the solar system. We'll see distant stars wandering through the galaxy. And we'll see thousands of supernovae exploding millions of light years away in different galaxies. And for the first time in history, we are going to have an astronomical catalog that dwarfs the number of people on this planet. Something like 40 billion stars and galaxies will be mapped by this telescope. And we are going to serve that data up publicly. Right? So everybody in the world can have their hands on this data. Uh, the future of astronomy is one that is open and public and ready for the, the next generation of scientists to explore. Thank you. <laughs>